Hey, what is up everybody? This is Stevie Breach coming to you here today. Today I'm making a video. And this video is brought to you by none other than freaking Yaya88, one of the guys that brought me to the game of making videos here on YouTube. He has dusted himself out of the mothballs and brought himself up to YouTube today, pumping out a video for the YWC, the top 10 matches of WrestleMania history. So I thought that is what I would bring to the dance today. Um, I have not had a chance to watch Miguel's video. Um, often when I, I see top 10 videos that I think is a really good idea, I won't watch their person's video because I feel like they'll sort of talk me in to raising matches higher than what I already have them on my list right now. So here I took down some notes. I honestly wrote down about 70 of these matches on my own, and then I went to WWE.com. They have a top 33 matches of WrestleMania list, and I sort of ran through their list um, to sort of use their list to maybe make, make some bumps uh, up and down along the way, and maybe find some some uh, the last three matches to fill in my 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 uh, my holes there. Um, I will honestly tell you that uh, I did not put any matches from WrestleMania 26 on there. Um, I remember I made a video a while back that WrestleMania 26 was one of the greatest WrestleManias of all time. Uh, I've always said that I, I, I admit it. Uh, I, I'm a homer. Uh, that was my first WrestleMania that I ever attended, so I'm always going to remember that more than anything else. But, you know, it, 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 if, if it comes down to remembering the matches to put them on your top 10 list, that opening battle royal that was on the pre-show um, would be on this list because I remember everything that happened um, in that match from uh, Yoshi Tatsu um, getting the win to uh, the NXT guys coming out and watching the match while standing on the stage. And I thought that was a really good moment for guys like Daniel Bryan, Skip Sheffield, Wade Barrett, um, Justin Gabriel uh, to stand out on the stage and see like, you know, you know, you're in NXT right now. That was a brand new show. Um, they're, they're on there. But, you know, you work hard. You'll make the main roster. This is where you'll be. Or if even from here, maybe you'll get an actual match next year. And I think at WrestleMania 27, I think from all of those guys, honestly, only Daniel Bryan was scheduled to have a match. Um, but it ended up being pulled. And he ended up being in the pre-show Battle Royal at uh, WrestleMania 27 anyways. But, uh... You know, a lot of those guys were on the main roster because of what was going down with Nexus and everything like that. So we'll get down to business. We're going to knock out the top 10. We're going to go honestly um, as long as we need to go. Number 10 on my list is going to be The Rock versus uh, Hollywood Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 18. Uh, to me, this was uh, the payoff of WCW versus WWE, the Monday Night Wars. Um, the Monday Night Wars came to an end at WrestleMania 17. Um, when uh, uh, you know Vince ended up buying WCW from from them, you know going out of business, uh, Turner pulled the plug, um, and they were not going to be going on anymore. Um, at WrestleMania 17, it's always been rumored that uh, WCW is supposed to have some sort of an influence in the Vince versus Shane match, but you know a lot of people point to Sean Stasiak. Uh, running his mouth and telling reporters and radio interview people that you know they were going to be doing something at WrestleMania and uh, they felt that, that killed the surprise uh, and they ended up not doing it. I can honestly tell you that Vince versus Shane, right now I'm thinking of something I should have put on the list, but that match was probably better um, without having any of the run-ins uh, besides for uh, you know the Trish um, and Stephanie and um, you know Linda on the outside with Mick Foley being the special guest referee. But, you know, there was a lot of guys from WCW as well as ECW that wrestled on WrestleMania 18. Um, but to me, Rock versus Hogan was the first real dream match um, of having guys, um, you know, the, the real guys that you talked about. If WWE and WCW met up um, and had an actual pay-per-view show against each other, this is the Star Wars that would come out of it. Rock versus Hogan went out there. They put on one hell of a show. Both of these guys are two of the best performers um, there ever were. I think it was the right call to give The Rock the, uh, the win uh, over Hogan. Uh, definitely Hogan was uh, getting up there. Um, you know, he would go on to perform for a few more years before his body would just completely fall apart. Um, but uh, I think The Rock was one of the top performers in the game at that time, even though this is right when he was about to split to go make movies. I believe that, uh, right after this is when he started making The, the Mummy Returns. Um, it was after the, the Goldberg match uh, at Backlash. Um, but 
Um, really, really good stuff um, from here, from, from Rock and Hogan. Uh, from there, we're going to go to number nine on the list, which I'm going to give to Ultimate Warrior um, versus the Macho King, Randy Savage, at WrestleMania 7. Um, this was a, a career versus career match where basically loser leaves town. Uh, one of these guys was going to be forced uh, to retire. Um, the buildup happened to this was basically at uh, the Royal Rumble. Um, the Ultimate Warrior um, was the champion going into the show, having a match against uh, Sergeant Slaughter. And during that show, Warrior was approached by uh, Sherry. Um, and basically, she was pleading um, for the Ultimate Warrior to give a match uh, for the WWF Championship against Macho Man Randy Savage. Sort of not even thinking that the match against Slaughter was, was going to be anything. There was basically, Macho Man was just saying that, well, he didn't want to fight the winner. He didn't want to fight anything. He wanted to fight Warrior for the championship. So it was like a done deal, pretty much, um, that uh, Warrior was going to beat Slaughter uh, at the Rumble. Um, Warrior ended up turning Savage down. I honestly can't remember the terms of why he did it. Um, it doesn't really seem like that much of a babyface thing to do to turn down an open challenge um, like that, but but Warrior did it, and during uh, the Rumble title match, um, Savage came running down and smashed his Royal Scepter over um, Ultimate Warrior's face, um, causing it where um, Sergeant Slaughter got the win. I've made videos about this in the past, um, basically talking about that I was watching this on Scramble Vision, uh, meaning that I didn't order the pay-per-view because before... Um, we had uh, the cable the way it is now where you could just turn the channel and the picture wouldn't come in, but you'd be able to hear it like a radio broadcast. And I just couldn't believe that they were announcing Sergeant Slaughter, um, the WWE champion. Um, that would lead to uh, Warrior versus uh, Savage at WrestleMania 7. Um, because of the cost of costing um, the Ultimate Warrior his championship, uh, you know, the career was, was put on the line. So this was a big deal to me, you know, as a wrestling fan, I don't think I had seen a career versus career match or a loser leaves town match, um, of this sort of, you know, big proportions, uh, honestly, just yet. Um, you know, both of these guys were two of the biggest names in the business. Um, definitely, if we, if we were watching now, I guess we would be able to see that Ultimate Warrior was on the career uprise while Savage's career was sort of winding down. But we're only two years removed um, from Savage winning the WWE Championship at WrestleMania 5. No, he won it at 4 and main eventing WrestleMania 5 against Hogan. So it's not like his career was all the way done. But then again, back in the 80s, um, people didn't think their careers were going to go on that long. They thought they were going to be turning over a new leaf um, and maybe going into doing something else. Um, Warrior ended up winning the match. Savage ended up losing. Uh, this would, of course, set up, you know, uh, Sherry uh, turning on Savage. And then we also had Ma uh, Macho Man uh, get a, a welcome back from Miss Elizabeth, who came running down to uh, run off Sherry, who was beating up Savage after the match. So, this led to a really feel-good moment, uh, which would lead to SummerSlam 1991, where Warrior would team up with Hogan. And then, of course, Savage would get married um, to Miss Elizabeth um, in the match made in heaven and the match made in hell. Um, so, you know, really good stuff from, from Warrior and Savage. From there, we go to WrestleMania 6 um, with match number 8. It's going to be the Ultimate Warrior against Hulk Hogan. Um, possibly, at this time, the biggest match that I think that could honestly ever happen. Um, as a wrestling fan, I think I had only seen um, Hulk Hogan lose um, one match, of course, that it had been when you know they set up WrestleMania 4, taking the title off of Hogan with the Andre the Giant uh, main event. Um, or, of course, they had the double referees and all of that. So I thought there was no way in the world um, that Hulk Hogan could win. But then again, they had the Ultimate Warrior, um, who was a, a fresh, I guess you can say, big, young baby face who I had not seen uh, lose a match either, um, other than losing to Rick Rude uh, via Bobby Heenan. Um, but uh, they put baby face versus baby face in the ultimate challenge, the WWF champion against the WC, I'm sorry, WWF champion against the Intercontinental champion. Um, and two worlds were going to collide there in Toronto in the Astrodome. Um, the crowd was split just about every time they interviewed fans and asked who they thought was going to win the match. There was definite old school Hulk Hogan fans as well as new school Ultimate Warrior fans. Um, and I thought this was going to go right down the middle and I didn't know how it was really going to end. But, um, you know, this is a match that I think honestly, other than the way I remember it, 
is still a very, very good wrestling match. For people who don't think that Hulk Hogan knows how to work or he was ever a really good wrestler, Hulk Hogan does almost all of the work in this match. Ultimate Warrior, he does his stuff, um, but you know the, the, the stuff that is sort of knocked against Warrior, he does blow himself up running to the ring. Um, you know, they had the very long entrance there, but that's what he wanted to do. Um, you know, and then of course they, they had to do a lot of holds, um, and wear down moves and, uh, you know, Hogan did the honors. Ultimate Warrior, um, was supposed to, you know, go into the, uh, the next reign of being the WF champion. I think at this time, you know, Hogan was going to go off and make some urban commando. Um, so he had, you know, dreams of going out and making movies, but not with Vince McMahon. Um, so I think this was supposed to be a big change, a lot like what happened to The Rock. Um, when The Rock started to leave and go make movies, um, I think people thought that this was going to be um, Hulk Hogan um, moving into the next. All right, that sucks. I'm sorry. I lost all my momentum of where I was going there. But basically, Hogan the Warrior WrestleMania Six was my number eight pick. I thought that that match honestly was the best way. I know that we, you know, went through Hulk Hogan leaving wrestling um, at WrestleMania Four, at WrestleMania Six, um, at WrestleMania Eight, at WrestleMania Nine, um, and the guy wrestled it all the way until I think WrestleMania Thirty was his last WrestleMania appearance. Uh, WrestleMania Twenty. Uh, WrestleMania 19, I guess, would be the last match he ever had. So, yeah, this guy had a lot left in the tank uh, to give. Uh, from there, we go to number seven, Undertaker versus CM Punk uh, at WrestleMania 29. I really liked this match. Uh, I know that Undertaker had the streak on the line, and that was one of the biggest things going in wrestling at this time. CM Punk, uh, one of the most over-wrestlers, um, he was able to reach... Um, uh, a, a creature of fans um, that, you know, definitely uh, didn't fall in line with what a lot of people like. CM Punk was one of the most popular wrestlers um, in wrestling before he even reached uh, WWE and once he was able to get on ECW uh, and from there, you know, basically build his fan base on Monday Night Raw. Um, he got more and more popular. Uh, people really liked his attitude. People really uh, liked um, the, um, the, the lifestyle that he had behind uh, the character, uh, people thought that he was a really good wrestler on top of that. So, um, honestly, in my mind, CM Punk was one of the most believable guys to beat Undertaker streak at WrestleMania. Um, to, to me, uh, the Undertaker streak really came alive uh, around WrestleMania 23. Um, when Undertaker went on a streak of matches where he would have matches against Batista, against Edge, two against Shawn Michaels, two against Triple H. Um, and then the last one being against CM Punk at WrestleMania 29. To me, I, I, I see Undertaker beating all of those guys. But to me, CM Punk was one of those guys that I thought was going to be the future of wrestling. This ended up being his last WrestleMania match um, when he would pack his bags after the Royal Rumble before WrestleMania 30. Um, and I, I don't think he's ever going to return. Um, this it could be one of the best WrestleMania matches that he has to hang his hat on, in my opinion. I can't think of many. Um, he had the match against Rey Mysterio at 26. Um, he had the uh, two Money in the Bank wins. Um, shoot, I can't remember what he did at 27. And 2080 wrestled against Chris Jericho in a match I honestly could have fell asleep during. Um, but with Undertaker and CM Punk, the build-up was awesome. Um, basically, uh, Paul Heyman and CM Punk pushed Undertaker to the limits. Uh, they brought up Paul Bear's death. They poured Paul Bear's ashes out of Undertaker's urn on the stage. Um, they basically was pushing Undertaker to the edge to get the most out of him at WrestleMania. Uh, and I thought that CM Punk beating Undertaker made a lot of sense because I, I, I don't think anybody thought that was going to be his last WrestleMania. I think people were thinking that CM Punk would be on top of wrestling um, until WrestleMania 35, and, and probably then on from there. I mean, it wasn't like he was going to be giving up anytime soon or retiring or, or fading away or going to find other projects. If him and Triple, uh, Triple H and Vince McMahon would all be on the same page, he'd still probably be main eventing this show right here coming up around the corner. Um, <laughs> In the match, Undertaker was able to get the win. I don't think anybody's feelings were hurt. I think that everybody thought the match was really good when it was all said and done. Um, you know, from Undertaker, he would uh, 
I guess he would stay away uh, until coming back for WrestleMania 30 against Brock Lesnar. Um, CM Punk uh, was on the roster until right before 30. I can't really remember what he did between 29 and 30. Uh, he must have had that match against Brock Lesnar. So maybe they turned him and Paul Heyman broke up after this. I, I'm guessing it's been so long ago about where they went from there. Uh, number six on the list is Batista versus Undertaker. This is a freaking awesome match. And there's a lot that goes into this about why Batista versus Undertaker is such a big match. Undertaker had won the Royal Rumble that year. And Undertaker had his choice of who he was going to face. Um, for um, the, the, the main event of WrestleMania 23. Uh, Undertaker, you know, basically over a period of weeks went out and he scouted if he wanted to fight um, John Cena for the WWE Championship, Batista for the World Heavyweight Championship, and even showed up to, to see what Bobby Lashley had going on on ECW to go after the ECW title. Um, those are three real big talents um, that were in the WWE at the time. All three of these uh, guys were big stars. And Undertaker decided to go after the SmackDown World Heavyweight Championship, going after Batista. Um, definitely one of the biggest stars in the business. But when WrestleMania came around and Vince McMahon planned out um, how, what he was going to do for WrestleMania, Batista versus Undertaker was not the main event. They ended up going with Shawn Michaels um, versus... Uh, John Cena. John Cena, of course, being the main guy from the A-Show, Monday Night Raw. I don't know if that's what panned out. That's the reason why they ended up going with that one. To me, um, the match was supposed to be John Cena versus Triple H in a rematch from WrestleMania 22. Um, but uh, Triple H uh, ended up coming down injured. And Michaels was sort of like that last-minute replacement um, to sort of save WrestleMania um, and, and have John Cena a really big match. And it, honestly, in my opinion... Triple H is always going to be one of my, my favorite wrestlers. Uh, I think that Shawn Michaels and John Cena over-delivered uh, and delivered a really good match, which ended up being the main event. But when it comes down to watching SmackDown and watching Raw, Undertaker versus Batista had the bigger build. Undertaker versus Batista had the bigger star power. And I think they had the best storyline that came in and delivered the best match. Uh, we saw Batista powerbombing Undertaker. Uh, or I guess the Batista bombing him through the table. Um, we saw the choke slams from The Undertaker. These guys really went out and delivered one hell um, of a highlight film for WrestleMania. And as the story goes, is that Undertaker collected his title and he walked back to the back. Um, then once Batista reached um, the curtain and he walked through a, a gorilla, he yelled at Vince and he basically yelled at the roster who was standing around to try your best and follow that. Undertaker and Batista deserved to have the main event of WrestleMania 23. Uh, and when the cards came down, it did not uh, you know, happen for them. But they still had probably one of the most memorable matches from WrestleMania. From there we go to WrestleMania 5. I'm hoping that this is not going to be on a lot of people's lists. But um, WrestleMania 5, um, I'm sorry, number 5. WrestleMania 8, um, this is Roddy Piper against Bret Hart. Um, this is a really, really good match, and I've always said that I've always drifted towards watching Bret Hart as I was a kid, and I didn't really understand why guys like Kerry Von Erich, uh, Mr. Perfect, and Bret Hart really stood out to me, even though they weren't wrestling for the WF Championship. I was always into these guys as real wrestlers, real technical wrestling, um, the way it was supposed to be done. Um, Bret versus Piper was sort of, sort of built as the new school versus the old school. Roddy Piper sort of brought up this thing that, uh, the Piper family and the Hart family were one and the same, and they were ancient cousins um, that you could trace back to a, a certain cousin marrying another cousin or something like that, and um, the two uh, were together. I'm not sure if um, Stu Hart had any hand in Roddy Piper getting trained or anything like that, but they really made it seem like these were two families um, that were you know, going to be going out there and doing battle. Uh, and one of the things I remember more about this match more than anything else is during... Um, the uh, backstage segments where they're being interviewed before the match. One of the things they don't really do for WrestleManias anymore is the uh, pre-fight and the post-fight interviews with the guys in the back, uh, with Mean Gene and Sean Mooney, Todd Pettengill, and things like that, is that basically um, Brett makes it look like he was at a sucker punch Piper at the end, and he pulls back and he says, I would have got you. And that's when Piper pulls his fists out of his, uh, his tights and basically he already has it ripped, uh, all wrapped up and he was looking for a fight right there. Um, Brett and Piper went out there 
Um, they did everything that they could do. Um, Brett, I think, gets colored during this match, um, and he ends up, you know, winning the Intercontinental Championship. Brett, of course, had won the title uh, at SummerSlam 1991, and then I believe around the time of the Royal Rumble, ended up losing the match to the Mountie, I believe, at a house show. Um, and then Piper ended up winning uh, the title from the Mountie just days um, days after, um, and that's what set up Brett versus Piper. On the Piper um, DVD um, that came out years ago, uh, Roddy Piper it says that one of the only championships he ever won during his wrestling career was the Intercontinental title uh, for Vince McMahon and WWF, and that was sort of something that Vince asked Piper to come back and have this match, and Piper, you know, sort of said he had to ask for it, and Vince gave it to him. He wanted to have that sort of crowning moment of winning a championship, and they weren't going to make him WF champion. Uh, so Intercontinental title was as good as it gets. And uh, Piper is a guy that really doesn't need titles uh, to define himself, whether if you want to link him in to Dan Marino or Charles Barkley, um, just sort of you know great players in their sports that never were able to win the championship that some people sort of make jokes about him for. But you know they, these are really good quarterbacks. Uh, as well as basketball players that deserve to be in that uh, conversation of being the best of all time. Uh, from there, we're going to go to number four on the list, which is Sean versus Angle at WrestleMania 21. Uh, at the time, this was looked at as one of the best wrestling matches of all time um, since WrestleMania 3 with Savage versus Steamboat. Um, I remember the first time that I really heard people talking about this was a shoot interview. Um, from Roddy Piper and Ric Flair, where they sat down together to sort of have a conversation about the wrestling business. Uh, and they basically were saying that this is hands down the best wrestling match that they had ever seen. Um, and that they didn't know what guys were going to have to do to top this. Um, Sean and Angle were definitely two of the biggest stars in WWE. Um, this was looked at as sort of a dream match when they were taking a guy from Raw and a guy from SmackDown every year and sort of putting them together. This is before the days of Survivor Series like they do now or bragging rights of the past. Um, it just was basically looked at as, as a dream match. The only way that Raw and SmackDown would ever coexist. The only way that Raw and SmackDown would ever touch. Um, Sean was, was one of the best wrestlers uh, of all time, while Kurt Angle was definitely one of the most best wrestlers uh, of that time right there. And these guys came together and put on one hell of a clinic. Um, I've always thought it was one of my favorite wrestling matches of all time. Um, my buddy Ravi, Assault and Battery 777, ruined this match for me a little bit. I always thought that this was on an equal playing field um, and that Angle gave Sean everything that he could and Sean gave Angle everything that he could. But Ravi one day told me that he watched that match and he basically thought that um, Sean was just basically hanging in there and Angle uh, was able to counter everything that Sean gave it to him. And that's sort of the way I look at it now. And it's one of the reasons why this match has slipped uh, to number four on my list. It's still a wrestling clinic. Uh, one of the most um, clean wrestling matches that you'll ever see at WrestleMania. Uh, it's a really, really good one. Um, Sean versus Angle at WrestleMania 21. Uh, from there we go to number three on the list. And actually number one, two, and three are all... No, shoot. Never mind. Scratch that. Uh, number three on the list uh, is going to be Sean... Uh, um, no, shoot. We're going to scratch this again. We'll edit this out in post. Number three on the list is Daniel Bryan versus Triple H uh, at WrestleMania 30. This, of course, was the first wrestling match uh, of WrestleMania 30. If you go and turn uh, WrestleMania 30 on on the WWE Network, um, you will see that the first hour of WrestleMania 30 is going to be a promo of The Rock Triple H and Stone Cold Steve Austin uh, inside of the ring. And then you're also going to get Triple H um, going out there and battling Daniel Bryan. Uh, and that's all you're going to get in the first hour of WrestleMania 30. And you're going to be very entertained for the whole thing. Of course, this is going to be the coming out party for Daniel Bryan. Um, sort of uh, a storyline that was created by the fans uh, that lasted all the way from WrestleMania 28 to get him to 30. Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 28 came in the World Heavyweight Champion before getting broke kicked in the face uh, by Sheamus and losing the title in 8 seconds. From there he was able to build himself up over a year to have a WWF Tag Team title match um, at WrestleMania 29 um, with his tag team partner Kane. Um, and then basically... 
I, I, I'm even surprised that he was able to reach that high because it looked like coming out of WrestleMania 28 that they had really no plans for this guy whatsoever. But um, you can go back and you can look at you know people thinking that he was going to win uh, the Royal Rumble this year and him not even being able to participate. Um, and, you know, them having him join the Wyatts and people thinking that it was going to lead to Bray Wyatt versus John Cena uh, at WrestleMania 30 for the freedom of Daniel Bryan and Cena would be fighting for Bryan and all this other jazz. I'm not sure what they were going to do. That Bryan heel turn where he joined up with the Wyatts where they just kept beating him up and he finally just said, all right, that's it, I'll join. Never really say, uh, made any sense to me, but that's what they were going for. But, um... He got down to it where the fans all rushed the ring on Monday Night Raw one week. And um, we had uh, Daniel Bryan um, added to WrestleMania, wrestling against Triple H. Where if you know Daniel Bryan was able to beat Triple H, Daniel Bryan would be added um, to the World Heavyweight Championship match of Randy Orton versus Batista. Um, you know, the battle of evolution, I guess you could say. Um, we all knew... Um, that Brian was going to win this match, but it was still one hell of a feather in his cap to be able to win this. Uh, um, uh, Triple H gave uh, Brian just about everything um, in this match to make him a huge star. And I know that you know the minute that he uh, was able to um, to win the match, we all knew that Brian was going to win the championship that night. It's just a matter of you know getting us to the main event and finding out how he was going to be able to do it. <coughs> I still think that the opener is better um, than um, the, the finish. Uh, I just think it was just, you know, just getting us to that point and just wanting to believe that it was actually going to happen for Brian, that he was going to win the title. Everybody, you know, was doing the yes chance. We were all going bananas. Um, but um, Brian versus Triple H at WrestleMania 30 is a match that I'm always going to be able to say. Um... um uh, I'm always going to be able to say that that, that was one of the, the best matches that uh, I'm going to be able to say that I was at. Um, from number two, um, we're going to go to Triple H versus Undertaker at WrestleMania 27. Um, this, much like the number one match, is something that you could easily put the rematch up there against. But I didn't want to go against using rematches and using guys against each other more than once. Um, Triple H versus Undertaker at WrestleMania 27 was a match that I went into praying that Triple H was not going to win. And as a Triple H fan, you should be rooting for your guy. But there was so much negative attention uh, against Triple H, basically people thinking that Triple H booked himself against Undertaker at WrestleMania 27 with the thought that he was going to be able uh, to go in and just get the win. Um, I don't think that uh, that's what... Uh, I, I just... I just didn't want that to happen at all. I didn't want anybody to be able to put more negative attention on Triple H as putting another feather on his cap of winning another championship or saying that he was able to end the Undertaker streak. But when they went out there, they had one hell of a match. I really thought that Triple H was going to beat them. I mean, when Triple H hits um, the... Uh, um, he uses his own move against him. When he hit him with the tombstone, I thought it was lights out. I thought it was over right there. I thought there was no way in the world uh, that Undertaker was going to kick out of that. Uh, of course, you know, Undertaker did the nosedive um, out of the match. And um, I'm trying to think that the end of 27 uh, is where they finished in the middle of the ring um, with Undertaker. Um, I think he had held him in, heaven, in Hell's Gate. And Triple H was reaching um, for the... Uh, uh, for the sledgehammer, and we all thought that he was going to basically kick out of it that way by hitting him with a sledgehammer and then be able to hit the pedigree and the one, two, three. But, but Triple H didn't have enough strength left in him. He was able to tap out and basically able to say it was over. From there, of course, Undertaker would be carted out of WrestleMania 27, uh, which would lead to them wrestling again at WrestleMania 28, but basically saying that Triple H didn't beat him, but he beat him more than he'd ever beaten, beaten before in a WrestleMania match, and he was that close beating the streak and he wanted one more shot. Um, number one on the list, no surprise, is going to be Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25. Um, this match to me is one that I'm always going to be able to remember. I, I was streaming this match. I was 
watching it on my computer, but I had it hooked up to my television, so I was watching it on a stream that way. Um, I had just joined Twitter, um, and everybody um, was buzzing about this match where we were sort of live tweeting it. But, uh, this was back in, I want to say this was 2009, or it might have been 2010, so the very early days of Twitter, um, where, there, where there really wasn't that many wrestling fans on there as it is now. Um, but... Um, I, I remember the, the, the one thing that got me more than anything else is when Undertaker did the nosedive out of the ring, um, and it was uh, Shawn Michaels and the, the uh, cameraman that was out there. The cameraman would be later uh, pointed out uh, as the guy that you know messed this spot up. I believe it was uh, Jimmy Snuka's son. I, I can't remember exactly what his name was, um, but he was the reason um, that... Um, basically take her crash uh, on the ground and I didn't really know if he was dead or not you know there's things that happen in wrestling that you can tell um, that there was no way in the world that that was supposed to happen even though the, there is a script and they, they, they go through the matches and everything like that to sort of kill the buzz but um, I, I knew that Sean jumped in the ring and he stopped the referee from making the count um, but nobody was able to go out there and check on Taker. I don't think that um, Taker wanted anybody to check on him. They gave him all the time in the world to sort of get himself back together and get back into the ring um, and still have the match um, still go. But um, I didn't understand why Sean didn't want the, the streak to end via count out, but you know, I think that he wouldn't be able to look himself in the mirror uh, if that's the way that the streak actually did end. I think Sean wanted to switch in music him. Uh, and get the pin one, two, three there in the middle of the ring, and that's the way that the streak finally ended. Um, there's things that I still remember about WrestleMania 25. The entrance from Sean, I still don't understand. He comes down from the heavens uh, wearing that white coat, and then all of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, he's got this sort of Shawn Michaels uh, get-up on, and he's walking down towards the ring. I don't know how that magical um, you know, costume change happened, but... This is, this is one of the best matches to me. I mean, I started this match out watching it on the couch, ended up watching it on my knees, uh, just basically feet from the television, um, and just sort of not knowing what was going to happen. And the second that you know it was over and Undertaker got the win, it was a sigh of relief um, and just thank God. There is no way in the world I actually thought we were going to see Shawn versus Undertaker again at WrestleMania 26. Um, but of course, everybody can remember at the Slammies, um, you know, he, when even he was out there um, in his DX getup, and you know, nothing was really pointing them going in that direction. Sean would challenge the Undertaker one more time. Um, he would show up at the Royal Rumble, um, trying to go out there and win it, um, because he knew that was the one way he was going to be able to challenge him. And then, of course, when Sean jumped up in the SmackDown Elimination Chamber match and made sure that Undertaker lost. So he would not be the champion uh, to fight at um, WrestleMania. I honestly thought that it was just straight genius to set up 26. But I'm always going to remember 25 being the better match. I, mean, I, I, I started going at 26, but for the reason of saying that, I was glad to see, uh, I would have been able to see Undertaker versus Shawn. I wish 25 would have been my first WrestleMania.